Psalm chapter 1. Let me just read. There's six verses in this psalm. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf doesn't wither, and all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Heavenly Father, today as we pray to prepare to open your word, I pray that you would open up our hearts, that we would be challenged and changed and encouraged simultaneously. Holy Spirit, we believe that you can make that happen through your holy word in our hearts, and we ask for that. Make us humble. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I want to talk about the foundation of blessedness from Psalm chapter 1. Um, at my house a few years ago, my wife and I agreed that we wanted to have some apple trees. We thought it would be great to have apple trees so in the summer we can go out and grab apples. And we were told you need two apple trees so that they can cross-pollinate. So we went out and we bought two apple trees. And now the negotiating process begins in our family because where will the apple trees be planted? Uh, as the guy who mows the lawn, I would like them planted as some in somewhere that is not one more obstacle for me to go around. With uh, six kids growing up, we have lots of obstacles in our yard. And so there was a compromise that was reached. One of the apple trees would be smack in the middle of the yard. The other one was my choice. I put it in a, an area that had been landscaped. It was up close, closer to the house, uh, by, kind of by the air conditioner, where I wouldn't have to mow around it. Now, the thing about these two trees is, is they w have lived a very different life. The well, first tree that my wife chose, she chose wisely. She planted this tree right in the one of the most uh, wet, wettest parts of our yard. The downspout came out right next to this tree. It flowed right into the, the, the path, and, and sort of the, yard, the water from that side of the yard flowed right past this tree. The soil was rich and dark in this place. It was uh, very, <laughs> it was great soil. This tree has thrived. Now, the tree that I chose, not so much. I, I planted this tree so I wouldn't have to mow around it, so it was up against the house in an area that was sheltered from rain. It was on a hill, so rain, water didn't stick there. There was nothing really to hold it, and it was in really bad soil. And after a couple of years, I noticed that Clarissa's tree was doing a lot better than my tree. Like, her tree was flourishing. It started to produce apples. My tree had one apple. It was like this big. And, uh, and the leaves were yellow. And after about four years, one day I walk out, and my tree is just leaned over at about a 45-degree angle. So I got concerned. Well, what's happening with my tree? I went over and looked at it, and I, I straightened it back up, which is a sign that it's not a good sign. I staked it in the ground and propped it up, and I let. a year later, I noticed it was yellow. It barely had any leaves. It was barely surviving at all. Clarissa's tree was beautiful and big and had and was starting to grow apples, and it was great, my tree. So I decided I needed to move my tree. I said, this is maybe the best chance for it. I literally walked over to it, and I pulled it out of the ground. The, the roots were like this big around, uh, about it. And, uh, and so we replanted that, and it died. It did not make it. And I was thinking about these two trees, the difference of them. When the storm came, when the wind blows, Clarissa's tree stayed. It, didn't, it wasn't staked anymore. The roots were deep and held it in place. My tree, when a wind came, it just blew it over. And I thought about that as a metaphor for life. This morning as we were setting up, a, a, I don't know if you saw, a big kind of storm cloud came by, and a huge gust of wind picked up this whole, 
this whole tent that I'm standing under. In fact, uh, we had to grab it. Four of us were holding it to the ground so it didn't blow away. And I thought, I want to be the kind of Christian in life who when the wind comes, when the, when the storm comes, that I'm anchored deep, that I don't just flail and fall over. And so many times I don't feel like that kind of Christian. So many times I feel like I'm going to crumble beneath the wind. And with all the turmoil in this world, how do I thrive? How can I be well-rooted? How can I, in this, in, in this turmoil of our life right now, and especially right now in the last three months as so much has happened, and even in the last week as so much is going on, how can I be a Christian who has his roots dug down deep and doesn't flail in the wind? Well, the answer to that question is really the one thing I want you to remember today. I always tell you to write down one thing, and, and here it is. To be rooted in righteousness, delight in the law of the Lord. To be rooted in righteousness, to not flail in the wind as a Christian, to not flail with whatever trials and tribulations come our way, to be rooted in righteousness, delight in the law of the Lord. Someone, a fellow pastor asked me this week how I was doing. How you doing? I think that's a trick question. <laughs> Because it's been a, a crazy three months. And I, and I said to, to this fellow pastor, because he got it, I said, let me tell you about two weeks in March that started this whole part. Um, right about March 1st, my mom moved in with us. I've told you about that. We sold her house, and, and she moved in with us. And we're building another house that will have a, a mother-in-law apartment for her. And so my mom moved in, and then COVID hit. Uh, and then my college kids all came home because of COVID. And in the mean, in the process, I, like every other pastor, is trying to reinvent the way we did church and the way we assembled and gathered online. And, oh, by the way, that same week we started construction on the church and we laid the foundation for our new house all within days of each other in the days of COVID hit. And my son got married that week. And I just remember going <laughs> Those were a rough couple of weeks. I mean, I get it. You guys have had weeks. You guys are enduring all this right now. And there are times where for you, something in particular is added in addition to all the other stuff that makes you feel like you're going to blow over. How can we not just flail in the wind? We need to be rooted in righteousness, and we do that by delighting in the law of the Lord. We're going to start this series in Psalm, and we're going to be there for a couple of months. Every other, the reason that we're in Psalms right now is every other summer, we do Psalms, Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs. It keeps us in the wisdom literature, and there's such a rich depth to the Psalms. The human experience is chronicled so beautifully in a way that we as human beings relate to God. And we're going to spend our summer in the book of Psalms, and I thought it would be good to preach once again Psalm 1, because Psalm 1 is an introduction. In, in the Psalms for generations, uh, Psalm 1 didn't even always have a title, Psalm 1. It was seen as an introduction. This Psalm was seen as an introduction to the whole Psalter. And so when we look at Psalm 1, it's appropriate for us to see every other Psalm in light of this one. And I take our structure for the text today, as we have three points, uh, right out of verse 6. The very last verse, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Today I want to talk about the righteous for a little bit. I want to talk about the, the wicked for a bit. And then I want to give some conclusions that the psalmist offers in verse 5 and 6. So let's look at the first three verses together. And let's talk about the righteous. What does it mean to be rooted in righteousness? How do we become righteous? How are we righteous? So the text starts with the word blessed is the man. Blessed is such an interesting word. We don't really know what it means. <laughs> blessed. What does it mean if I'm blessed? What if I'm blessed? What does that mean? And initially, we might be tempted to think of happiness. And there is a sense of happiness in the word blessed. But it's deeper than that. The Hebrew idea of blessedness is the idea of this wholeness and completeness. 
It's not just temporary happiness. I, I think there's no greater illustration of the concept of fleeting happiness than the McDonald's Happy Meal. It, it was designed to bring happiness to your children for all of 30 seconds. Have you ever played with a Happy Meal toy? You watch. I make them wait till they finish their Happy Meal. Be, not that I would ever feed my kids fast food. I wouldn't, right? No, but if I were, I wait them to make them wait to the end. Of, they got to finish their food because I know the joy of that toy will last all of 30 seconds. And then it will be thrown away. Happiness is fleeting. Blessedness is wholeness and a depth that we don't necessarily understand. And the righteous one is blessed. So when the storm comes, the righteousness has a peace and wholeness that transcends circumstances because he's well rooted. Now, I think it's important to stop and say, blessed is the man What does the text mean by man? Are we only talking to half of our people here today? Is this for only for men? Well, no. Just like in in the English language, man, we use it generically. The Hebrew uses this word to speak generically of the human condition or humans. the, The Hebrew simply means blessed is the one or blessed is the person. This is talking to all of us. Blessed is the one. Now, if we're going to talk about the righteous, the first way the psalmist defines the righteous is by what a righteous person is not. He walks not in the counsel of the wicked. He stands not, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor not sits in the seat of scoffers. There is a beautiful, uh, um, there is a beautiful movement to what a righteous person does not do in the text. You you notice, the the righteous person or the wicked person here, the righteous person doesn't walk, doesn't stand, doesn't sit. Do do you see the movement? So at one point, this person is just walking around, talking, interacting with the wicked. The wicked in, in this passage mean people who are guilty of a crime in court. That's, that's the idea. Someone who's guilty of a crime. So you're walking, you're moving, and you pass by, and you start interacting with someone who is wicked or guilty of wickedness. And then all of a sudden you stop, and you stand in the, in the path or in the way of sinners. So now you're just hanging out. You're looking for it. The sinner is someone who, as opposed to the wicked, is a one-time offender. The sinner is someone like a repeat offender. This, this is a, a someone who repeatedly engages in wickedness. So we've been walking, and, and we interact with a, a, a wicked, a guilty person, and, then, and now, we're stopped, now we're looking for it. We're waiting for him to come by so we can interact with him. And then, now the last one, sit. Okay, now you've been seated. You're at the city gate where all the important stuff happened in the ancient culture, and you're just waiting wherever the, the wicked are, the scoffers. The scoffers are people who mock righteousness. They scoff at it. The wicked would say, well, I'm guilty. The sinner would say, yeah, I'm guilty. The scoffer says, I'm not guilty. The scoffer says, I I laugh at your rules. I mock that you say that what I've done is wrong. That's the scoffer. I was watching a TV show this week. And uh, it was a dad who had a teenage daughter, and they were sitting in the kitchen, and the teenage daughter was running late for school, and she came in, and she made a smoothie, and she just made this huge mess, and she just left it on the counter and started walking out the door. And her dad said, young lady, stop. (laughs) Come back and clean that up. And then she throws the teenager fit, you know, the, well, I'm, I'm late. I don't have time to clean it up. I'll get it later. And he says, you turn around right now and clean it up right now. We're gonna have ants in our house if you don't clean that up. She goes, I don't have time. That's stupid. I'm not cleaning it up. And he says, young lady, get back here and clean it up. And she looks at him, and she looks at him, gives him the look that whatever you're telling me is stupid. And she walks out the door and slams it behind her. And as a dad, I just went, cool. She's a scoffer. She's scoffing, saying, whatever rules are for you, I define my own rules. The righteous one, he or she doesn't put him or herself in a place 
where you're constantly interacting with the wicked. You're careful. You don't receive your counsel from them. It's like taking a bath. Uh, my wife always asks me why I hate taking a bath. I hate taking a bath. Give me a shower any day. I don't want to take a bath. Why do you not want to take a bath, Dave? Because I don't want to sit in a pool of my own filth. That's how I feel about it. It's disgusting. Uh, that's what the psalmist has in mind. The righteous person doesn't sit in a bath of his own filth or <laughs> someone else's filth. The righteous one avoids this. Look at verse 2. Now there's this great word, but. <laughs> but rather. But is such a word of contrast. The, the word but is such a word of contrast. It changes. You, it says the righteous person, person doesn't do this, but what does he or she do? Look at what the text says. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The law here is simply God's written word. There's a general sense to it as the spoken and written words of God. And the righteous person finds delight in this. And he or she delights in it enough to meditate on it day and night. The word meditate in Hebrew means to, a lo to speak with a low murmur. That's what it means. It means you know it so well that you're whispering it under your breath all the time. That's how much you love the word of God. <laughs> My, my little kids have, uh, Kai and Levy, seven and nine, have, on Disney Plus have been engaging in the rather old movie now, Lemonade Mouth, which is a ton of music in it. And uh, some of you older kids will remember that from when you were a kid. But uh, Olivia plays this song constantly. She loves it. She looks it up on Spotify and, and listens to Lemonade, Lemonade Mouth. And the other day I was sitting uh, out at my house trying to get some work done on it and I found myself whispering the lyrics to the song under my breath. Have you ever had a song stuck in your head that you can't get out and you sort of murmur it? <laughs> that is the meditate word here. Under your breath, you love and delight in the word of God so much that when you have nothing going on and there's no noise, that's what's murmuring out of your mouth. You want to be rooted in righteousness? Murmur the words of God. Now, to be honest, most of us here today probably should feel a little bit of conviction right now. Because we don't know the word of God like that. We know Disney songs. We know top radio hits. We know Christian music. We know a few verses that we've seen memed on Instagram. But for most of us, our some of our Bible knowledge is reduced to an Instagram meme that is taken out of context and only supports whatever fad or idea that we're currently on right now. For most of us, that's how we view the Word of God, as something to support what we think we already believe. But the psalmist says, if you want to be rooted in righteousness so when the storm comes, if you want that, you got to know and love the Word of God. How about start by memorizing Psalm chapter 1? It's six verses. That's it. Six verses. You could memorize Psalm chapter 1. You could put that in your brain. You could print it out, put it on your phone. You could murmur it to yourself while you're driving or sitting there with nothing else to do. You could say, I'm going to put Facebook away and, and maybe look at the verse of Scripture. If you, because I, you value being rooted in righteousness more than being entertained. It's tough. Joy comes not through instant gratification. Joy comes through developing roots deep in Scripture. The word never changes. This is the joy of memorizing and murmuring Scripture. Is that this never changes. Think about all the things in our world that are constantly changing right now. Um, I wrote a few things down. Culture. Our culture is constantly changing. Changing at a more rapid pace than I think at any his point in the history of the world. Culture changes. Research changes. Public opinion changes. Government policy changes. Expert advice changes. 
But the word of God never changes. And so move around this. In my personal anxiety, I need the word. I was just telling someone that there were about two or three nights this past week where I woke up at 3.30 pretty anxious about some things that are going on in our world. And when I was anxious, I felt this tension because I knew I needed to write this sermon. But the last thing I wanted to do in that moment was to engage my brain in Scripture. What I wanted to do is run to a TV show and try not to think about everything. But when I turned to the words of Psalm 1 and forced myself to, all my anxiety lifted because of the power of the Word of God. This leads us to the next metaphor. The, the perfect metaphor for the righteous one. We've already hinted at this. Verse 3, he, the righteous person, he's like a tree, like my apple tree, Clarissa's apple tree, planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf doesn't wither and all that he does, he prospers. This idea is that a tree planted by water has an adequate source of nutrients and the roots go down deep and are well fed. This is not a temporary high. This is deep nourishment. And this isn't a sugar rush. You know, like about 3 o'clock in the afternoon when you just hit that low point and you're like, how am I going to get it through the rest of my work day? And so you grab a candy bar or a little sugar or go hit up on some caffeine, and you know you will come crashing down, but it gets you through the moment. A well-nourished person who meditates and murmurs on the Word of God is nourished from a deep place. It's like eating protein. It's protein for your soul, a deep anchor. That's what the, the word of God is like. The next thing, it says, this tree, its roots are down deep, well nourished. It bears fruit. The greatest kingdom work is done through those who aren't celebrities. They're rooted Christians. You know, Christian celebrities are all the rage in the last 20 years. Well, we have new Christian celebrities all the time. Depending on your theological bent, you might have this celebrity or that celebrity. And uh, Christian celebrities rise, we put them up on a podium, and then we yank them down as they fall in disgrace. You know what? The one who loves the Word of God is the one who bears fruit, the one who is deeply invested. Uh, this is super encouraging to me because to do kingdom work of God, you don't have to be a celebrity. You just have to be deeply rooted in the word, and then you bear fruit. The last word he describes this tree is one who prospers. Now, this word, initially we think, wow, what does it mean to prosper? That means to be materially blessed. Maybe I, I'll, I'll get everything I ever wanted. Maybe I'll be successful. And that is not at all what the psalmist has in mind here. The idea of prosperous here is the idea of brought to completeness. It's, it's, you finish the work. Whatever you're bearing fruit, whatever kingdom work you're involved in, it means you, he continues to the end because the storm is coming. Endure, prosper, be brought to, com to completion or wholeness. As I, I was thinking about this, and, and especially in light of thinking about celebrity pastors, I was thinking about my good friend Joel Andrus. Joel is uh, significantly older than me, <laughs> but he doesn't look it. Uh, but Joel ministered at Martinsdale Community Church. Some of you might know that church, a little town down in Martinsdale. I, I don't remember the exact number, but he served as their pastor for, I think, over 40 years. He was a picture of steadiness and longevity, and Joel Andrus loves the Word of God. He's deeply rooted in it. And their church, at a time when everyone was evaluating church by size, Joel, loving the word of God and loving the gospel of Jesus Christ, kept planting churches out of his church. Over 40 years, they planted at least three churches that I know of, and one of their churches planted a, another church, which is, is like a grandchild church to him. And I'm so proud of Joel. As I look back on his faithful ministry, at one point, he sent half of his church to the next town over to plant a church. See, you only do that if you're rooted and find your significance as a pastor. 
Not in the number of people that are here, but in something deeper, the Word of God. J Job pro has prospered. He's retired now. You look and it was like, yeah, well done. Completeness. Still doing ministry. He's never going to quit. That's what prospering means. See, you, you want to do that? You want to have a long time ministry? You want to be a Christian who, when you look back at your life, has been following Jesus for year upon year upon year? Love and anchor yourself in the Word of God because stuff is coming. And the only way you will endure is if you have deep, root, deep roots in Scripture. The righteous. Rooted in righteousness. Now, the second thing that I, I want to talk about today is the wicked. To be rooted in righteousness, the light and the law of the Lord, the psalmist in verse 4 now takes a turn. He's told us about the righteous person, the blessed person. Now he's going to talk about the wicked. And he only gives us one verse. The wicked are not so. They are like the chaff that the wind drives away. So he, here's the structure. The, the righteous person is not. But the righteous person delights in the law of the Lord. The he's like a tree. Now he's going to work backwards. He says, but the wicked aren't like a tree. They don't have deep roots. They're like the chaff that the wind drives away, like tumbleweed. Just rolling along, blown wherever the wind goes, where, whether the wind takes it to destruction or not. It has no roots whatsoever. Whatever wind of culture comes along, he's just blown away. That's what the wicked are like. No root system. The wicked are not, they're, like, they're not like a tree. They're like chaff. And then by implication, the psalmist wants us to work backwards. He's worked up to this point for the righteous person to the tree. Now he calls the wicked person chaff, and we're supposed to read backwards everything that's true about the wicked person. So if you read backwards, he doesn't let meditate on the law. She doesn't ingest the law. She doesn't care. She'd rather spend her time on Instagram than the Word of God. He'd rather look on Twitter. He'd rather engage in whatever crazy topic of the day is out there than actually engage the Word of God. He hangs around in a bath of his own filth. He's not blessed. Do you see how the psalmist did that? He worked us to this point, and then he says the wicked are the exact opposite. They're like the chaff that the wind drives away. And that's all he has to say about the wicked. It's like, do you want to be that person? you want to be tumbleweed? Or do you want to have your anchor set, your roots dug down deep? And then he puts it all together. To be rooted in righteousness, delight in the law of the Lord. And he gives us his conclusion. Therefore, that's that great word, therefore. His conclusion is this. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. There is this final consequence for all of us. The wicked won't stand, like stand in righteousness. There is a day of judgment coming when we said in Nehemiah, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. There is a day for the wicked to stand before God and answer. There are final consequences, and they won't have a leg to stand on. They won't be standing with the congregation of the righteous, not the wicked person, because the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. Now, here's the thing. When we read this, we always have to ask the question, what does this tell us in light of Jesus? Jesus said, all the law and the prophets point to me. So this is pointing to Jesus. And what we know about the gospel of Jesus is that all of us on our own are wicked. There is no righteousness. When we stand before God, I can't say, hey, God, look at all the stuff I did for you. There's no righteousness. But the beauty of the gospel is that God says, yeah, I know you can't be righteous for me <laughs> enough. He says, what I'll do, I'll do it for you. And that's where the God of our faith, the God who we celebrated in this Apostles' Creed, the God who transcended time and space and came to us. And when Jesus died, and rose from the dead, and when we put our faith in him, we receive his righteousness. 
And so we can read a psalmist and go, I will never be righteous enough for God, but in Christ I am. So the Christian doesn't meditate on the word of God. The Christian doesn't engage in in study and put down roots in the word of God so that God would look at him or her and be pleased. Rather, the Christian does it because we are in Christ, because our anchor is deep in Christ alone. That's why we do it. And so we anchor ourselves in the word because we know the trials are coming and because we know that we're righteous in Christ. That's the gospel. And the roots then that we develop by saturating ourselves in the word of God, the roots that we develop, we do this because we bring wholeness and joy and blessedness as we dig down deep and it gives us the courage to face the storm that is coming. And so I want to know, how do you weather the storm? Are you anchored in the word of God? Do you find this nourishing your soul? To be rooted in righteousness, we need to delight in the law of the Lord. I I want to close with just this simple illustration. If you have uh, ever been to Chicago, um, you might have gone up to the top of the Sears Tower. It's now called the Willis Tower. But it uh, used to be the tallest building in the world, not anymore, but it's really tall. And if you stand up there, one of the freaky things about it is it sways in the wind. It's designed to sway in the wind. So when you're up there, the whole building top can shift as much as a foot or 18 inches. And you put that 1,450 feet in the air looking out, that's a little bit (laughs) unnerving. But you know what? It's never blown over. It's swayed in the wind. It's never blown over. How can the building that's that tall not blow over? Well, I read a little bit about engineering. I, I'm not an engineer, and I never played one on TV, but I can read it about it. And, uh, and the, the Sears Tower below the building has 100 feet deep of solid concrete. That's a lot of concrete. And below that, they dug another 100 feet down, giant cylinders of concrete into the bedrock. So that the building, the cylinders, actually fuse with the bedrock of the earth. They put down roots for the building. With everything going on in our lives today, you guys, we need to be rooted. We need to care less about what bloggers say and more about what our God says to us. We need to listen to fewer radio hosts and TV programs. We need to listen to fewer comments on Facebook and care more about being rooted in the depths of God's word. But it's because it's the only way we'll survive. It's the only way we will find joy in the midst of the storm is if our roots are deep into the bedrock. So my challenge for you today as we walk away is, are you rooted in righteousness? Do you delight in the law of the Lord. And in it, would you find all of your hope in this? As our worship team comes back up to lead us in a song, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, to this we come to you, confessing that we need Jesus and the gospel more than ever. And with all the stuff going on in our lives, we need you, Jesus, more than ever. And we confess that we are not rooted in your word, but we long to be. We long to find that wholeness. So God, would you help us, give us the courage and stick-to-itiveness to be people who love the word of God, so that when we read Psalms, and we read about the human condition and all the pain and all the difficulty, it all stems from a rootedness in the word of God and roots in Christ Jesus, who became righteousness for us. And so in this way, we put all of our hope in you. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.